our beautiful poinsettias have been given to the church to the glory of God in memory and honor of loved ones by friends and members. Thank you each and every one for being here today. Anna and family to come and share with us the readings and lighting of the Advent candles. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. We light this candle as a symbol of the Prince of Peace. May the visitation of your Holy Spirit, O God, make us ready for the coming of Jesus, our hope and our joy.
First reading is from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 11 and 16. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut, you, have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and be disturbed no more, and evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. The second reading is from Romans, chapter 16, verses 25 through 27. Now to God, who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed, and through the prophetic writings is made known to all the Gentiles, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word. Now the children are invited for the children's lesson. me today to share with you I want to read to you something from the Bible first okay this comes from Hebrews chapter 1 beginning with the first verse in the past God spoke through prophets to our ancestors in many times and in many ways in these final days though he spoke to us through a son. Who was his son? Who's God's son? Jesus, that's right. And God made his son the heir of everything and created the world through him. The son is the light of God's glory and the imprint of God's being. He maintains everything with his powerful message. After he carried out the cleansing of people from their sins, he sat down at the right side of the highest majesty. And the sun became so much greater than the other messengers, such as angels, that he received a more important title than theirs. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning, about titles. We get named different things, don't we? When when a, a, a 
girl gets married, she usually changes from Miss to Mrs. That's a title. When somebody graduates from medical school or dental school, they get the title doctor. We have lots of different titles. One time I got to be called the principal. That was a title, wasn't it? To be the principal of a school. We use a shortened form of words sometimes. Like every time the doctor writes out his name, he doesn't write D-O-C-T-O-R, so-and-so. He uses an abbreviation or almost like a monogram. This is a monogram for me, for Paula Watson. It's a shortened version of my name. We have something really special at this time of year in our church that is an abbreviation or a monogram of all these special words about God and Jesus. Does anybody know what that thing is that we have in our church right now that does that? What'd you point at, Kate? Not exactly. What's that big thing right over there? It's a chrismon tree. And chrismons are monograms or ways of saying Jesus or God's name. And each one of those chrismons has a special meaning. Let me find the right words here so I read it to you right. Um, this chrismon, and I took some of these off of our tree, and I'll put them right back on when we get finished with worship this morning. This has some special symbols on it. Can you see these special symbols right here? This one and this one? This means the Alpha and the Omega. That means God is here from the beginning until the end. He's the beginning and the end. He is. And what is this a symbol of? If this is a cross. And if you look on that tree, you're going to see a lot of crosses. Why is the cross so important? That's right. This is the symbol of, God, of Jesus dying for our sins. This is not just for death, though. By Jesus dying, we were forgiven. So it's a sign of forgiveness. I want you to look really, really carefully. And I couldn't reach it. Look way, way, way at the tippy top of that tree. What do you see up there? A what? A crown, and the crown is for our King of Kings, our Lord of Lords. That's a very special symbol on our tree, isn't it? And I think there was one more I wanted to share with you. Where did it go? Where did it go? There it is. Oh, I know. Why are there all those white lights? What do they look like? Stars. Because Jesus is the light of the world. So when you look at that tree, I want you to think more than just a pretty tree with lights and, and pretty ornaments. I want you to remember it as a tree of, of God, a tree of Jesus and what he means to us. Can you do that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so excited right now because we know that it is soon to be Christmas Day, the day that we celebrate our Savior's birth. We just ask that you be with us, guide us, and help us always to focus and to remember why we have Christmas. And I want to say these last words that my grandson Cohen, Lord, said for you at the end of his Christmas program at church. Jesus is the reason for the season. Amen.
In considering the atmosphere, the atmosphere of relationships among humans in the world today, I offer to you these words of prayer that I discovered this week. They're words penned by Walter Brueggemann, found in his work, Prayers for a Privileged People. I invite you to hear as we ponder anew this Christmas coming. Had we the chance, we would have rushed to Bethlehem to see this thing that had come to pass. Had we been a day later, we, have, we would have found the manger empty and the family departed. We would have learned that they fled to Egypt, warned that the baby was endangered, sought by the establishment of the day that understood how his very life threatened the way things are. We would have paused at the empty stall and pondered how this baby from the very beginning was under threat. The powers understood that his grace threatened all our coercions. They understood that his truth challenged all our lies. They understood that his power to heal nullified our many pathologies. They understood that his power to forgive vetoed the power of guilt and the drama of debt among us. From day one they pursued him and schemed and conspired until finally on a gray Friday 
They got him. No wonder the family fled in order to give him time for his life. We could still pause at the empty barn and ponder that all our babies are under threat. All the vulnerable who stand at risk before predators are babies who face the slow erosion of consumerism, are babies who face the reach of sexual exploitation, are babies who face the call to war placed, as we say, in harm's way. Our babies elsewhere in the world who know of cold steel against soft arms and distended bellies from lack of food. Our babies everywhere who are caught in the fearful display of ruthless adult power. We ponder how peculiar this baby at Bethlehem is, summoned to save the world. And yet, we know how, like every child, this one also was at risk. The manger is empty a day later. The father warned in a dream. Our world so at risk. And yet, we seek after and wait for this child named Emmanuel. Come be with us. You who are called God with us. This we pray, Emmanuel, in your name, even as we pray the prayer that you would later as an adult teach your followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, as those who have the courage to pray together such a pray prayer, I invite you to stand together and join in our affirmation of faith as you find it in the bulletin. Let us remind ourselves, we are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. ties and our offerings.
I'm going to share with you from the alternative gospel reading from Luke. It actually picks up where the reading posted in the bulletin ends, beginning in the 39th verse of the same chapter. At that time, Mary got readied and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And Mary responded, My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. A word shared between Elizabeth and Mary and with God a word shared by Luke to the church in the first century, a word to the church of the 21st century. Thanks be to God. want to share with you what really is a prayer, but those of us baby boomers know it more as a song, but really it is a prayer penned by John Lennon and Paul McCartney. When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And in my hour of darkness, she is standing right in front of me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. 
And when the broken-hearted people living in the world agree, there will be an answer. Let it be. For though they may be parted, there is still a chance that they will see. There will be an answer. Let it be. And when the night is cloudy, there is still a light that shines on me. Shine on until tomorrow. Let it be. I wake up to the sound of music. Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom. Let it be. Let it be, let it be. Let it be, yeah, let it be. Or, oh, there will be an answer. Let it be. Let it be, let it be. Let it be, yeah, let it be. Whisper words of wisdom. Let it be. Amen. As I share those words of a song, there are several thoughts in there that come to mind on this day and in the scene of the world that we find ourselves in. First of all, times of trouble. Second of all, for us Protestants, it's a challenge to exactly the place that Mother Mary holds in our faith lives. We have a lot to be learned from our Catholic brothers and sisters. And then wisdom. The wisdom of one knowing that I can't sing. And I've learned that. But if I could have, and to have sung this song would have been another point to be made as we come on this particular Sunday. Wisdom and song. Jim has helped to share his wisdom as we pick out hymns, songs during this season of Advent. Wisdom, aside from a pastor insisting on sound doctrine in preaching and teaching, there is perhaps no more topic of dissension in the life of a pastor, in the life of a director of music, and in the life of the church than the choice and selection of music. During times of nationalist patriotic holidays, what choices does the pastor and the director of music make? But even more so during this season of Advent, when our culture has already pushed Christmas hymns upon us, well, even now at Halloween, we have a difficult time pushing Advent when culture pushes Christmas. Hymns. And today in our lectionary reading, actually the reading that's encouraged in the United Methodist Church, we get a hymn, a praise hymn, sung by Mother Mary the mother of Jesus, a hymn that many might not prefer to hear or may not ever have thought about what exactly she is singing. So to try to make sense of something to share with you to ponder today, think about what she is singing and think about who she was, and think about who Elizabeth was, and think about John Lennon and Paul McCartney starting their song with, 
When there are times of darkness, Mother Mary comes to me. And the first thing that Luke does, trying to share the gospel with people that are living in a situation, a tumultuous situation, much like we find ourselves in today. Except that Phillips Brook, Philip Brooks would have penned O Little Town of Bethlehem, how still we see the night. It was not silent and still on that night in that time. It was, in fact, Rome on the doorstep of Rome's Vietnam. It was a powder keg waiting to explode, sort of like what we find ourselves in today. It was a time when women and children were put down in their place and kept in their place by men. It was a time when the people of God struggled to be the people of God. When the people of God got caught up treating people exactly the way culture treated people. And picture Elizabeth. Elizabeth is a righteous, religious, God-fearing, obeying all the commandments of God, faithful follower of God. This barely teenage family member, pregnant from Galilee. From Galilee, the wrong side of town. And she shows up. This one who is marginalized in status, in gender, because she's pregnant, out of wedlock, stigmatized, at risk of death under the religious laws of the day, bearing the pain of humiliation of bearing a child out of wedlock, And she has the courage to travel and to knock on the door of this pious, righteous, God-fearing, commandment-believing, Bible-believing Elizabeth. Oh, in my times of trouble and darkness, Mother Mary comes to me in order for us to invite the Christ child anew into our lives, we must be willing to accept the mother of the Christ child. Oh Mary, how, how will I respond? What will, my, what will my church family think of me? How will I respond to you who has not lived up to the way that faithful people of God should live? In order to receive the Christ child anew, how do we receive the bearer of the Christ child? How do we respond today in today's climate to those who don't live up to our standards? To our standards of what it means to be a Bible-believing Christian, a God-fearing human. How do we respond? How would we respond if this young, barely a teen girl comes.
this visitation causes your pastor to consider anew my attitude toward those who don't live up to what I think, I expect, I believe, a human, well, I guess a human, let alone a Christian, or a Christian, let alone a human, should live in the world today. How should I respond? Good question. But Mary maybe can help us anew. Mary, I think, can help us ponder anew what Jesus in reality came to do. There is a billboard on I-20 coming from Florence in this direction. Every time I pass it, I want to stop the car if I carried a ladder that was about 50 feet long, I'd go up and tear it down or whitewash it. The sign in huge letters, based just, it just simply says this, heaven or hell, the choice is yours. That's the billboard. Mary, today, maybe 12, maybe 11, maybe 13, pregnant out of wedlock. I wonder what the ones who put on that sign would think about Mary. I don't know. What did Christ come to do? What was Christ's purpose? What was God's purpose? O oh, Mother Mary, come to me and sing me this song anew. He, God, has performed mighty deeds. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down the rulers from their high places and lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. Luke is speaking to a group of people struggling on human relations, faithful people of God, and basically by sharing this song of Mary's, this praise song of Mary's, he basically is saying God has reversed everything that you think is right. It's a hymn about reversal. It is God finally invading this world to cause a great reversal among us. To rescue those from a social system and cultural values that valorize status, wealth, and power and effectively oppresses most people. that is quite fine with the marginalized because as long as there are marginal, then I can feel good about myself. Mary reminds us, as we have all of this bickering and I shared with a high school classmate of mine, I said, I'm reminded of being a elementary school kid in the playground with somebody who I don't like saying, I dare you to step across this line. 
And if you do, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw a dodgeball at your face, but we're playing with more than dodgeballs today. And Mary reminds us that what we're about to worship anew and praise God for on tomorrow morning is that God chooses the weak. God chooses the marginalized. God chooses the judged. God chooses the damned. God chooses from that which is nothing, worthless, despised, wretched, and dead. That's what Elizabeth was counted, being a barren old woman. Worthless. God makes that which is nothing ostracized and criticized and pointed at to be something precious, honorable, blessed, and living. And on the other hand, God makes in the coming of that newborn king that which is precious, honorable, blessed, and living to be nothing worthless, despised, and wretched. I worked and read long and found a word from I don't remember who the preacher was. But he had the courage to say one thing and then the grace to end with something new. His courage was to say what I've already said about myself. Mary is talking and praising God, and I am on the negative side of that praise him. For I know because I've done demographic studies of Lee County and I am the rich, I am the filled in Lee County, South Carolina. I've been to Ghana, West Africa, and I am the rich and the filled compared to a lot of people in the world. So the hard part of the gospel story and Mary's song, which she borrowed from Hannah, by the way, is that I'm on the negative side of that hymn. I'm on the side that thinks I'm something in compared to those Marys on the pregnant 11-year-olds and 12-year-olds, unwed, pregnant for whatever, but after that pastor brought me to my senses, he said this. The good news, I'm still standing here today. I woke up today and I could say this is the day the Lord has made. And I can find Christmas. I can find Bethlehem. I can find it anew. And I can find it by joining God. Joining that baby. I can find heaven on earth. Peace. Goodwill toward all men by responding the way Elizabeth responded, not just in word, but in walk. I can find Jesus anew. I can. I can. If I will just reassess 
what Jesus came to do and what it really means to have new life and new birth, second birth, and what it means to live life and live life abundantly on this good earth. I can because God offers the grace to do it. May God invade deep into the innermost rooms of our ends as we approach this night. May God have us to reassess the welcome mats and the welcome signs on our doors. For Mother Mary might show up Paula and I experienced this one time. I don't know if I'll ever recover from it, but a Mary type showed up at worship one Sunday in a far off appointment to be unnamed. Good folks, they let us know it, that they were good folks. But that young mom was shunned. Oh, not in words directly, but she was shunned. She never came back, and I felt bad. And I thought about John Lennon and Paul McCartney. When in times of darkness, Mother Mary come to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. Let me find myself to be like Elizabeth and less like me. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, amen.